everyone. Just a couple of departmental announcements before we get started. Um, first of all, thank you to seniors who installed work on the second and third floor of the Lazarus Center. I wanted to let you know that that work can be removed as soon as Thursday, but no later than Monday morning, please, so that we can use that space for thesis defense. All right. Welcome to MICA's Mixed Media Series, which brings notable art makers, designers, and thinkers to campus to fuse our community with their insight and practices. The aim of this series is to build imaginative public events that showcase the diversity of practice in our fields and the complex relationship between creativity and the world around us. I'd like to first welcome Zach Parker, a senior painting major to the stage to introduce today's speaker, who also happens to be a beloved teacher of mine. Zach, come on up. Best known for combining lifelike figurative sculpture with precise stop frame animation, Elizabeth King is a multidisciplinary artist whose work softens the distinction between actual and virtual object. Marked by their painstaking detail and often uncanny humanness, King's sculptures emerge from her interest in the histories of puppets, mannequins, automatons, medical models, and legends in which artificial figures come to life. After receiving her BFA and MFA from the San Francisco Art Institute, King became an instructor of sculpture at the City College of San Francisco before teaching in the Department of Sculpture and Extended Media at the Virginia Commonwealth University from 1985 until 2015. King's work has been shown extensively in the United States and is in permanent collections such as the Hirshhorn Museum, the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston, the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts, and the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. Her most recent solo show, entitled Radical Small, was on view from February 2017 until January 2018 at the Massachusetts Museum of Contemporary Art, and last year, a documentary film about her work entitled Double Take, The Art of Elizabeth King was made and released by Floating Stone Productions. In recent years, King has received numerous awards, including a Guggenheim Fellowship in 2002, an Anonymous Was a Woman Award in 2014, and a membership to the National Academy of Design in New York in 2017. We are very fortunate to have an artist of such intellectual rigor and thoughtfulness in our company today. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Elizabeth King to Micah. Hi, everybody. Thank you for that lovely introduction, Zach. And um, thanks to Micah for bringing me here and for Renee for taking care of so many details and making me feel um, so welcome. And also to Stephanie Williams, who has, who has also made me feel welcome and pleased and excited to be here. I just wanted to start with this short little video. Um, it's a studio, just a couple of studio shots in which I'm testing a new neck and seeing how it works and seeing if those wooden slats will behave themselves as I'm tilting and turning the head. Um, but I also like this shot here um, because it's a great view inside the back of this head. The head's about the size of a baseball and inside is lots of stuff. And I like the fact that you can see all this stuff even though a lot of it is really um, totally practical and is involved with the joints and um, um, in this case, these two threads here are carrying fiber optic and they shine just a tiny, tiny bit of light into the backs of the two glass eyes. Not so that the eyes will light up, but just 
just to bring the whites up ever so slightly. Um, and then I'm, I'm manipulating the head just with a rod from off camera. Um, so the inside of the head and the outside of the head um, are both things that I'm, I'm interested in, how they look and what they might say, and in their simultaneity, so that always you're reminded that this is um, a mechanical figure, that it is making no um, illusions about itself as a made thing. You can identify the materials, um, you can see that um, that the joints are poseable, and you might see, and for years I showed the pieces in galleries hoping that the viewer would understand that it was posed this way for this show, um, but might be posed a different, a different way in the future. In, in, in that sense, bringing time into the life of the, of the piece, that it had a different past, that it might have a different future. To, I wanted to start um, start the talk with a quote. There was an amazing show last year in New York of the drawings of um, the the sp um, Spanish anatomist uh, Santiago Ramon y Cajal, who um, in the early part of the last century won a Nobel Prize for his discovery of the behavior of the neurons of the brain and specifically that they weren't two-way conduits, that each cell was only a one-way conduit. And this really changed and shifted the way people understood the functioning of the brain. And this, um, this the drawings were made looking through a, um, a standard microscope. This is predates electron microscopy. Um, and they were made on tiny little bits of paper with pen and ink, not verbatim what he saw through the microscope, but he adjusted what he saw in order to diagram the behavior of, of the neurons of various parts of the brain. Um, and this drawing, the drawings are tiny and tremblingly beautiful. And um, this is a drawing of the neurons of the retina. And the, the show posted some text next to each of the drawings from Cajal's writing. And the text next to this drawing read, the retina is the oldest and most persistent of my laboratory loves. Life never succeeded in constructing a machine so subtly devised and so perfectly adapted to an end as the visual apparatus. I felt more profoundly than in any other subject of study the shuddering sensation of the unfathomable complexity of life. And I, you know, I have goosebumps even reading it now. It was such a moving voice to hear while looking at this, and it's huge on the screen, but the drawings are very small. They're not even, maybe there's, you know, they're maybe seven by nine inch yellowing paper, crumbling paper, extraordinarily precise and beautiful pen and ink drawing. So he was really a, an amazing artist as well, as well as a scientist. The iris of our eye is a sphincter muscle and it dilates or contracts like a camera's aperture in response to light intensity. And this is a photograph taken in the 1980s by um, the Swedish photographer Leonard Nilsson, who was famous for his photographs taken inside, not the dead body, but the living body. And I guess he somehow figured out with fiber optics how to photograph, maybe during cataract surgery, an extraordinary series of images of the inside of the eye. Oh, I love this one because you see this great big sort of moon here, that's the lens of the eye. And then you see the, um, the, not the iris, but an, another sphincter muscle right behind the iris called the ciliary muscle, ringing the lens. And then if you look closely, um, you can see um, tiny, tiny little thread-like attachments between the ciliary muscle, that big purple uh, lobed muscle, and the lens itself. Um, 
and um, th those are called, those little fibers are called the zonules of zin. And um, when the ciliary muscle contracts or tightens, the zonules go slack and the lens rebounds into its thicker shape like an onion for close-up vision. And when the ciliary relaxes, it pulls the zonules taut and that pulls the lens into a more lentil-like, which is the source of the word lens, a more lenticular shape for distant vision. And my question is, how does the eye know the difference? If I hold my finger up and look at it and then shift my attention to the person sitting in the last row here in the theater, how, does, how, do, how do those smart sphincter muscles know that it's time to contract and time to relax, to pull my lens taut? I love this, um, this p page from a work by Rene Descartes talking about just that, only mistakenly assuming that the whole eye changes its shape in order to adjust the focal length um, of distant versus close-up vision. So the eye that was blinking when you came in was shown recently at MassMoca and we projected it so it was about as big as it was on this screen in the gallery and then nearby we had in a little case the actual sculpture itself um, and you can just see it there in the far distance, this little tiny little thing so people would have to wander up and see it. There's the case and here's the eye. And the eye I made collaboratively with an ocularist. This is someone who makes artificial eyes, prosthetic eyes for people. Um, and the eye itself is made of a heat and pressure cured acrylic with literally an oil painted iris. And um, Earl Schreiber, the ocularist, made this eye hollow so that I could insert a ball and socket joint inside it and then build movable lids and a movable orbit to support it. Um, and then years went by and I had a chance to animate it with stop frame film. My title for this talk, Three Things a Robot Cannot Do, is based on a passage from a 1966 book by the British psychologist John Cohen. The book is called Human Robots in Myth and Science. In the book, he offers chapters on automata from antiquity, from the Middle Ages, the alchemist's homunculus, the golem, literature's host of artificial beings, enlightenment ideas of what is human and what is machine, the great clockwork automata from the 16th to the 19th century, Charles Babbage and the origins of the computer. It's a wonderful book. I really recommend it, um, published in the 60s. In his final chapter, Cohen writes, it would seem that at least three things characteristically human are out of reach of contemporary automata. In the first place, they are incapable of laughter or tears. Secondly, they do not blush. And thirdly, they do not commit suicide. He goes on. It's conceivable that robots of the future may be capable of all three. However, until we have a better understanding of the nature of laughter, it would be unwise to assume that we shall be able to teach robots how to laugh. And about blush blushing, he writes, Darwin called blushing, quote, the most wondrous of all the wondrous powers of the mind and the most human of all expressions. We blush when we feel exposed physically or mentally, when we have been unmasked, when we have made a stupid, mis stupid mistake, when caught red-handed, when wrongly accused. We blush when we merely think about what someone else is thinking of what we are thinking. And it is just as human not to blush when we should as to blush when we shouldn't. And in the case of suicide, he writes, a robot may be endowed with a capacity to bring about its own disorganization, but true suicide implies a foreknowledge of death and some idea of its significance. While we might argue about all this now, because that was all written in the 1960s and robots have come a long way since then, um, I really think that probably our most vivid robots and our most memorable ones are, are from the movies. And um, 
starting, of course, with Hal, the computer in 2001, who says memorably and unforgettably towards the end of the film, I'm sorry, Dave, I'm afraid I cannot do that. Or the robot in Spike Jones's wonderful short film, I'm Here, which is free on the web and you can watch it. It's about 20 minutes and it's a, a, just a terrific film if you've not seen it yet. Um, or the sexy robot in Bjork's music video, All is Full of Love. Or, of course, Mr. Scissorhands, Edward Scissorhands himself. Or Ex Machina, a film I haven't seen. I don't know why I can't bring myself to go just see the film, but I haven't seen it yet. Um, or robots from Blade Runner and The Terminator. You know, robots scare us because they're, they're made to have a life of their own, but we're still not clear on our basic definitions of life. Where's the line between an automaton and an automatic weapon? We make robots to compensate for things we humans can't do, work, remember, keep secrets, discover secrets, live forever, etc. Here's what those photos that I showed look like. Um, we hung them, they're pretty big prints. I like to test the resolution of a small piece by blowing it up, photographing it and blowing it up and seeing if it will hold up. Um, there was a nice long shot of the mouth at Masmoka last year. And you can see the show in general was a, a large dark space with small things lit up, small pieces lit up, and then a f one or two large magnified animations of those small things. Um, the piece on the right, that little tiny meaningless white spot on the right, had a long approach to it. Um, and I'll come back and show that piece in a moment. But this one, the one on the right is called Pupil. And just beyond it, there's a, a screen on the wall showing it animated with stop frame animation. Um, you know, early on, I moved from making fairly simple string puppets to uh, making pieces that were more mannequin-like, um, would hold the poses without s springs, strings, and w I got better at um, um, engineering and building movable joints that would hold their weight against gravity and be easy to shift so that I could just put my hands on the arms and pose them, stand back, take a look at it, tilt the hand a little bit, check that out, tilt the head a little bit, tilt the whole body, and slowly from one show to the next, I thought of this sculpture as a kind of instrument, almost like a kind of violin, and the pose was my sonata for that show. Um, the labor of making it always was rewarded by the joy of posing it and seeing what I could have it say, what I could have it express, how I could light it to sort of push that a little further, and in general, bring into um, the object a fairly convincing, if fleeting, illusion of, of, of an emotional presence. At a certain point, I started photographing these poses since they were perishable and would I couldn't remember them from one show to the next, nor could I remember how to document a pose so that if a piece sold, I could have some um, continued control over how, how it might be manipulated and how it might move. Um, and so photographing the pieces took on a certain life of its own as well, in addition to making the pieces. Um, and only really after I'd finished it did, I, did, I, did it occur to me that I could potentially animate it with stop frame animation. And I cast about for a, a way of doing it and talked about it and dreamed about it and suddenly had a fantastic chance to work with a really, really great crew in San Francisco at what was then the production company Colossal Pictures, um, which was a little bit like Industrial Light and Magic. It was a clearinghouse through which all kinds of really interesting experimental people came doing um, special effects for, for Hollywood films or doing uh, Pillsbury Doughboy ads or doing um, MTV station IDs or all manner of and, and ultimately short and then longer feature length stop frame films. So if you came last night, 
Um, let me show you this again. Um, this is the film that we made. That film was made before computers came along to help the process of stop, of stop frame, which is still very labor intensive and involves moving one or more parts bit by bit, incrementally, frame by frame, to generate the illusion of, of natural motion. Um, when I went to San Francisco with the sculpture, I worked with two really extraordinary animators there. I, I went out there thinking I was going to animate it. When I got, when I arrived, I quickly realized that this was an extraordinary sort of skill, uh, like playing chess, just an extraordinary um, practice and um, physical ability. And so I worked with Mike Belzer and Trey Thomas, both of whom then went on later to have lead animator roles for Tim Burton and Henry Selleck and other filmmakers working in stop frame. Um, and it was amazing to work with them. I mean, we, you know, we had no script, no plan. I wasn't sure what the piece could do. I wasn't sure what the animators could do. So each morning, myself and Richard Kizu Blair, my friend who had invited me out, would argue about what to have the piece do that day. And I always wanted to have it do um, inscrutable, ruminative, dreamy things. And Blair always wanted to have it do crazy, stupid, funny things. And so we teased each other and argued and agreed on a simple, maybe something not longer than five seconds. And I would, I would, I would mimic it and perform it. And then Mike and Trey, and with help, a little bit of help from me, but mostly just repairing and tightening things, would proceed to spend the day doing it. And watching them work was extraordinary. There was, there were no, this is, the, we were shooting on 35 millimeter movie film, so there was no way for them to see what they had done an hour earlier, two hours earlier, um, or understand what the momentum is of any given gesture. They totally worked out of their heads. Um, there was one crappy little black and white TV screen, I remember, that let them see their last shot. So from frame to frame, they would step into the stage set figure out which of the six things might be moving for that frame on what trajectory and how fast, so some things are moving faster than others. And they would, they would use these really interesting little machinist surface gauges. These are like little needles, little manipulated um, needles that they would bring out and set on the table with the sculpture and have that needle sort of touch an elbow. And then using the needle as a gauge, they'd move the elbow a sixteenth of an inch and other parts also with and then take the gauges away and shoot the frame and then come back in with the gauges again. So each frame was um, a fairly complicated um, sequence of steps and, and preparations, but still all done in their heads, all fleshed out and choreographed out in their heads for speed, tilt. It was mind boggling to see what they could do. and. 
I, of course, just was addicted to this and wanted to do this again and have had chances to do it as often as I can in the years since. Um, we edited the film into just a series of little clips, little dreamy clips, and um, I, the first thing I noticed is when I showed the film with the sculpture in a gallery, everybody stood in front of the film and nobody looked at the sculpture. And then they'd all come over if I was there and they'd say, wow, they'd say, how long did that film take to make? And I would say, well, it took three weeks to make that film, but it took three years to make the sculpture. So, well, then I got fascinated with figuring out how I could sort of even up the fight a little bit and figure out how to show, I wanted to show the sculpture and the film together. And um, I wanted to show the sculpture and the photographs together. So another thing that's sort of intrigued me and engaged me in the years since then is to figure out ways of putting an object and a film together across that language divide that film object interface, as I like to call it, um, in ways that might show me something new. But first and foremost, the sculpture, and I love this view from above, um, is an instrument to be moved and to be manipulated and to be posed. So back at the Mass Mocha show, this piece um, was shown with an animation of it, the animation on the wall, the sculpture in the vitrine, and you had a long 100-foot shot of this little head from the top of the stairs in the gallery, and I worried doing the show, I worried if small pieces could sort of hold, hold their ground in a big space, particularly a big darkly lit space, so I fancied and sort of nourished in my mind the illusion that somebody would approach the piece, and it would take a while to walk up to it and get there. And as they approached, you know, the piece would come into focus and they would, its scale would become clear and it would deliver a certain amount of fresh detail the closer you got. And you got a little closer and it would deliver a little bit more detail. I imagined my perfect viewer, you know, making this con very conscious um, advance and you'd get a little closer a few inches away and you would see new things would come into view and you would see the eyelashes maybe or you would maybe notice that the gap between the eyeball and the eyelids is pretty perfect or you might notice the puckers in the lips or think about you know what the piece was doing or the piece would operate on you maybe you would you would try and get into its line of sight and then you get a little closer and look at it as the thing that it is and wonder what the materials were that it was made out of. And then I, I, I thought, if, if that approach took long enough, would my viewer, my perfect viewer, keep going even after they got as close to the piece as they could and go right on inside the head with their imagination? And would there be enough hint of stuff inside the head that it would escort them, that it would escort my perfect viewer into the inside of the head to wonder what was in there and what was going on in there and what was going on in their own head. That neck that I showed you at the beginning of the talk, here I am making it. Um, it's two ball and socket joints, one just behind the jaw and then one at the one at the collarbone with a spring slung between them. And then around the spring, a set of wooden slats, which I haven't carved yet, but which I'm gonna clamp together and carve um, to capture what the neck ought to be looking like, what its profile would be depending on where the head was bent, where the head was pushed. And you can see there's some little paper models down at the bottom there that I'm using to help design this. Here's a shot of my studio. Here I'm working on a little wooden um, English boxwood um, articulated hand. So I've lots of studies of hands and casts of hands and I'm both carving and machining. Um, here's two hands, one which, was, one which was made more recently than the other, the lighter one that doesn't have that patina of age on it. I finished just a couple of years ago. Um, the hands are half life size by linear measure and um, they, they are articulated as far as I can go without having them break down into just a kind of robotic machine. So I was especially proud of the joint at the base of the thumb, a tiny little spring-loaded ball and socket joint that lets 
the thumb perform its classic opposable motion um, without breaking down entirely into a set of moving parts. So the first hand, which I borrowed from a collector who, who purchased it years ago, and the second hand were brought together at Mass MoCA on a stage that we built in the gallery where we shot a stop frame film in front of viewers. Um, this was something that I thought would be a great idea. And the museum was extraordinary and built a vibration proof stage in the gallery space so that stop frame could happen because stop frame requires um, an absolutely perfect non-moving environment to, to, to be done. Um, and you can see here, um, there's one hand, the other hand is yet to join it. Um, here's a little shot of the stage and some of the lights. We had some black curtains around it. And I invited Mike Belzer, with whom I had worked on the film that I showed before in San Francisco. I said, I called him up, I said, Mike, I know this is a crazy question, but would you be willing to do stop frame in public? <laughs> and he was willing to do it, and it blew me away. And he, he's based in Seattle now. He works for Valve, which is a um, game design company that has made a major um, contribution to the virtual reality world and developed the Vive headset. And now he animates in, for virtual reality. But he loves stop frame, and he misses stop frame, and he was happy to come. So he came to Mass Mocha. And we worked for seven days, um, and we animated this pair of hands while people came and went and could, and could see a little bit of the process. And it was a fascinating process to see, and I wondered what, you know, in, in, in a way, Mike was as riveting as anything else. Um, his focus and his behavior on the stage, he really, really went into the zone into the animator's zone, in spite of the fact that people were coming and going, there were kids and people talking and stuff was going on. He did it, it was just incredible. And then I made him wear gloves, you know, the ultimate insult because the wood is unfinished and it can't be soiled or stained. It was, the sculptures had their own demands. He did it wearing gloves in public in front of people. He did a beautiful series of, um, of gestures and animations with the two hands. When when I was once again, you know, what what am I going to have the hands do? You know, I had everything else worked out except that. Um, what the moment comes? Well, what what would you like me to have the hands do? So I had had some conversations with Denise Markanish, the curator of that show at Mass Mocha, and I told her that I loved watching and thinking about and imagining magicians practicing their their tricks at home and thinking about those gestures and thinking about the extraordinary skill and um, refinement and um, choreography of a magician's hands. And she said, oh my God, I have just the guy for you. Um, and she knew Derek Del Gaudio, who is um, a young LA-based card sharp and magician who just had an extraordinary show in New York last year called In and of Itself, a run off, off Broadway that was, I don't know if anybody saw it, um, keep your eye out for Derek Delgadio. Would Derek please videotape his hands and um, send me some clips? And by God, he did. So let me just show you quickly. I'll just show you one really quick, beautiful video clip of Derek practicing a card trick. And these became some of our, our models for what we were going to try and have the wooden hands do. That's the clip. Uh, there was about five delicious minutes of different him doing different things. And then here I'll show you um, just a little bit. My website shows all the clips, and I'm just going to show you one today based on that Delgadio clip.
that's the other thing I did to Mike. Go slow. I kept saying, go slow. I, I, I want these things to happen. This is extremely difficult in stop motion because it means you have to shoot more frame, more, more frames for, for an image and there have to be tinier increments of motion between each one. So he was wearing rubber gloves, working on a vibration proof stage in a public gallery, and I, for somebody who wanted him to move it very, very slowly. And he did it. He's an extraordinary, it was an amazing and fantastic. So I want to show you um, another piece with hands, this time with, an, with a wooden hand, the first wooden hand and its animation. This is a different animation. This is a piece I call Bartlett's Hand. And um, it's, I'm going to show you just a quick video of this is me setting the piece up. So for this piece, I worked with a wonderful Danish animator named Peter Dodd. And we shot um, in London, we shot um, a four minute animation of a single wooden hand in one four month take. So there were no cuts and zooms and pans to, to sort of cop out on. We rented the space um, in Elephant Castle and had a good concrete floor and we um, shot a continuous, my idea was to make the animation as much of a sculpture as I could. Um, so there would be no film language at all. And then I was going to pair it with the original sculpture, which, which would, the only thing we did with that animation is we flipped it so that we made the right hand into a left hand. And then I would show in a gallery the animation with the sculpture, and I would light the sculpture exactly as we lit it in the studio. And then I would adjust the film so that it was exactly the same size as the sculpture. I mean, here, this is a moving camera. I, that front hand isn't moving, the camera is moving. Um, to try and assemble a pair of hands across, the, across that divide. And here's how the piece looks. Um, in one, in a gallery setting, that empty frame in front of the two hands is the spot where the two hands are truly apparently the same size. When you get closer, the sculpture gets a little bigger. And if you stand farther away, the sculpture is smaller. Just that little bit of parallax made the difference. So I, I sort of marked the sweet spot with an empty frame. But then in my studio, I would walk past that frame and the parallax between the frame and the hands as I was walking by reinforced the tinier parallax between the sculpture and the film in a way that I found thrilling. I'm not sure anybody else would ever think about this or notice it or know it, but I loved the way the larger parallax between the frame and the, and the sculpture suggested the tinier and more delicious par parallax and difference between the two hands. Also at Mass Mocha, um, I showed this small bronze head with the, the back off. And if you look very closely, you can see the seam, um, something I spent a long time on to make the back of the head meet the front of the head in as invisible a way as possible. Um, so we, here's a shot of the inside of the head showing how the eyes are mounted. They're mounted with little, little rings so that I can manipulate the gaze and uh, manipulate the eyes inside the head. And I thought it would be interesting to show that. And so at Mass Mocha, I got a little light and shined it in, in the back of the head so that people could see inside and outside. And here's a few studio shots just to speak a little bit about how things are made. Um, this is um, a second head from that edition. The bronze is ready. I'm just putting it together. You can see all the various parts. Um, the bottom is a plate that's screwed on and then mounted to a, a mounting stem. Screwing, drilling for those screws. Here's the head. I make little, I cast little 
um, clamping blocks to different parts of the head so that I can fasten it firmly under the milling machine or the drill press for, for machining and drilling to hold it steady. I like that picture. <laughs> and then here we are putting patina on it. You can really see the scale here. And here, here's a second head from that addition with, with the patina on it. So even just photographically, and this is a series of, of a record of a set of poses of this one of these small hands. When I made this hand, um, I was assuming that I would make the rest of the arm, the other hand, and the body. Um, but I got fascinated with the life of the hand in relation to its film and showed it that way, and um, the piece was purchased. So I, I, I lost the beginnings of my next sculpture. So I have made a second hand. Here's a little offshoot piece of all the stages of carving and machining. I start out with a little piece of wood. I turn it round. I dome it. I I slot the dome, I carve out the gutter of the dome, I start over again and make the disc that will go into that moving knuckle joint, um, and then along the way begin hand carving um, the profile of the, the rest of the parts of the finger. So I like this little piece, it's called How to Make a Thumb. And here's a few other shots of, of pieces in the studio, just to give you a sense of scale and size. I make lots of life castings of my face, or the f in, in, in the cases of past pieces, and the face of my mother, um, different mouths and different muscle tensions around the mouth, um, all kinds of ears, and in the case of my own face, um, raised and lowered eyebrows, flared and unflared nostrils. This is a life cast of my mother and then a small wax sculpture um, made looking at that life cast. I spent about 10 years working with um, Earl Schreiber, an ocularist, thinking I might be able to learn to make glass eyes myself wanting to carry the idea of a portrait all the way to the eyes and be able to match the eyes of, of my sitter. I never succeeded, although I worked long enough with him to really gain an, an, an appreciation and amazement for this skill. And here's some test eyes, and also the smaller eyes are part of a collection that I've made over the years of um, doll's eyes from doll's hospitals and flea markets and, and um, taxidermy shops. It would be lovely to write a history of the glass eye. While I lived in New York, I would make, try and make some money repairing antique mannequins for various, I had three dealers I worked for, artist mannequins, fashion mannequins. Here's a, a pair that, um, the one on the right, a lot of the carving was done by Ruby Westcote, who was a, an extraordinary ca carver from BCU. Um, and the machining, you can see the blonde wood machining I did. And the one on the left is a little more hidden, but that one received elbows and knees and um, fingers. And that work was really an interesting source of information for me on how to design joints of my own and led very much to making pieces in wood rather than metal, the material I'd been using before. Here's some cutouts thinking about how to construct and design for the rotation of the forearm, um, the elbow, the wrist. This is an earlier piece, more like pieces that I'd been made, making before I worked on those mannequins. And these were heavier, more limited, required more fussing to pose. And here's a piece I threw in. I made this in graduate school. Um, it's called theater. and. I, I, it's the only time I've gotten the idea for a piece all at once. Everything else that I've made since then has come into form across work time. But this one, this piece I got the idea for it all at once. The night after I was in a terrible bike accident, in which I knocked all my teeth in and was pretty seriously injured. And I was at home on a lot of codeine. And I thought, I could make 
a fantastic theater that fits around your head. And so I did. I worked for the next year, and I made this piece. Um, it, it, I painted it red, hoping to make it friendlier, because it, it looked a little formidable. In fact, some of my teachers wouldn't sit in it. And, um, but if you did sit in it, and you would close around your head this little miniature theater, and if you spent about 30 seconds in there and didn't open the theater and, you know, and leave, then that little closet door would open and a tiny puppet would be in the closet chewing. She was made of rubber latex and I had a little motor. This is for um, Caleb if he's here. I had a little tiny motor um, under the stage and a little hinge jaw and so she chewed and looked at you through. There was a little mirror hanging on the wall nearby and she would continue doing that until you opened um, until you open those boxes and um, then the door would shut. Then years later I realized that it was kind of my model of the inside of a head, you know, complete with little homunculus, little film projector homunculus that the, you know, that was the conceit for, for many centuries that we thought that Descartes thought that the pineal gland converted all your sense, sensory input into thoughts and perceptions and understanding of the world. Now we know the brain doesn't work that way anymore, but I always love the idea of the Cartesian theater and the homunculus in there pulling the strings like a little miniature Wizard of Oz. And I think, you know, a lot of us, we, 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 we can't help but to imagine the insides of our heads as a space, a kind of space that we move things around in and rearrange and peek out the windows or listen at the door to see what's going on in the world. So I still have this piece. It's a little worse for wear, but um, it's it's a piece I like a lot. And then this is a this is a diagram that I found in a book by Daniel Dennett about how the brain works. And um, the diagram illustrates the fact that there are many parts of the brain that can't communicate internally, but require a loop that goes out the mouth and back in your ear um, for you to think a certain thought. So. This is also a kind of little Cartesian theater, a very different kind, more, um, a more chaotic one, but definitely a good drawing to look at in order to remember that it's important to speak up. So I just want to finish, I just want to finish with one other lovely reading. Um, and this one is from the anthropologist Clifford Geertz. And it's from a very famous essay he wrote called Thick Description. And um, I'll just read a little clip of it. I don't know if you know this piece. It's his famous distinction between a twitch and a wink. Um, he's quoting Gilbert Ryle, who coined the term, the philosopher Gilbert Ryle from the early 20th century, who coined the term thick description. And, and he says, Consider, Ryle says, two boys rapidly contracting the eyelids of their right eye. In one, this is an involuntary twitch. In the other, a conspiratorial signal to a friend. The two movements are, as movements, identical from an I am a camera, phenomenalistic observation of them alone. One could not tell which was twitch and which was wink or indeed whether both or either was twitch or wink. Yet the difference, however unphotographable, between a twitch and a wink is vast, as anyone unfortunate enough to have had the first taken for the second knows. The winker is communicating, and indeed communicating in a quite precise and special way. One, deliberately. Two, to someone in particular. Three, to import and part a particular message four, according to a socially established code, and five, without cognizance of the rest of the company. As Ryle points out, the winker has done two things, contracted his eyelids and winked, while the twitcher has done only one, contracted his eyelids. Contracting your eyelids on purpose when there exists a public code in which so doing counts as a conspiratorial signal is winking. That's all there is to it, a speck of behavior, a fleck of culture, and voila, a gesture. That, however, is just the beginning. Suppose, he continues, there is a third boy who, quote, to give malicious amusement to his cronies, unquote, parodies the first boy's wink as amateurish, clumsy, obvious, and so on. 
He, of course, does this in the same way the second boy winked and the first twitched by contracting his right eyelids. Only this boy is neither winking nor twitching. He is parodying someone else's as he takes a laughable attempt at winking. Here, too, a socially established code exists. He will, quote, wink laboriously, over obviously, perhaps adding a grimace, the usual artifices of the clown. Only now it is not conspiracy but ridicule that is in the air. If the others think he is actually winking, his whole project misfires as completely, though with somewhat different results, as if they think he is twitching. One can go further. Uncertain of his mimicking abilities, the would-be satirist may practice at home before the mirror, in which case he is not twitching, winking, or parodying, but rehearsing, and so on. It's, there's another paragraph here, and it's, it just gets funnier and more wonderful. And he uses this as an example of how difficult it is to interpret the gestures and code and behavior of a foreign culture. And he's, Geertz is famous for helping us understand that there is no such thing as an objective observation of another culture's customs and procedures. And I just want to end with this beautiful antique broken glass eye that was given to me by um, one of an earlier teacher who taught me to make eyes in acrylic. I mean, you can see the, the virtuoso glass work here, of the, particularly of the iris. And I just don't think that we'll ever, ever have a robot that can tell the difference between a twitch and a wink. Thank you. <laughs>